This is episode 128 of the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. Welcome to episode 128 of the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. Today I have Brian Bouchard on the show and Brian was a name that was mentioned to me. I looked into him and he's actually done quite a bit. He started investing at 22 years old. He's now into his 30s and the guy's got a lot of wisdom in this industry. He's been at it for a long time. He knows how to get cash flow. He is uh, currently working on a multiplex conversion. It's going to be a perfect burr and it's a larger project. We talked the numbers on that one but this guy ultimately he dabbles in a lot of different things and he seems to do it all profitably and he's got a really good mindset from what i took from the interview brian's open to different types of investments in this episode we talked about the fundamentals of going into the united states where to invest and why we think the way we do uh, we talked a little bit about crypto we talked a little bit about his stock option trading and uh, a little bit about his coaching and the different things that he's doing. So Brian's a really smart guy, really interesting, and I think you're gonna enjoy this interview. As always, if you're new to this podcast, I recommend you go right back to the beginning and start with episode one, especially if you're new with real estate investing. Uh, it will really help hammer some of the terminology home if you're not quite following along. If you haven't already done so, please take a moment and rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts. It just helps more people to find it. If you're watching on the YouTube version, by all means, please hit the like, subscribe, and notification bell, and leave me a comment if you haven't already done so. Uh, let me know what you think. Let Brian know what you think. Uh, really be appreciated. Please enjoy episode 128 with Brian Bouchard. Hello and welcome to the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. I have Brian Bouchard on the podcast. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Thank you, man. It's a pleasure. I appreciate it. Yeah. So, uh, Brian, I don't know your story. So for myself and for my viewers and listeners, if you wouldn't mind, just, uh, tell me your story. What is it that you do and give me a little bit of the backstory as well. Yes. Yeah, so I've uh, been a real estate investor since 2009. That's when I bought my first property, which was a duplex. I used the house hacking strategy back in 2009 as a result of, um, you know, which is a popular story coming across the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, that's what changed everything for me when I was young and started investing in 2009 and just kind of slowly building my portfolio over the years until, you know, as of the past few, kind of ramping it up a little bit more aggressively and getting into different strategies as well as, you know, becoming a mortgage agent, which kind of goes hand in hand with the investing and I also coach people one-on-one -on -one to get them kind of to the next level in wealth, not only in real estate, but other areas of personal finance as well. Okay. Uh, you, you got the mortgage license, huh? I actually have had my mortgage license since 2010. Nice. Yeah. No, um, I've always been a fan of uh, the financing side of things and the math and the numbers side. So it kind of goes hand in hand. Um, I, I'm a big fan of if you're going to be an investor long-term to have some other form of income in real estate to kind of complement the portfolio and become a specialist in, I think it's a strong skill to have. Yeah, I think that that's smart. I mean, I, I've had a lot of people ask, ask me um, basically like, you know, what should I do? Should I get my real estate license? Should I do, you know, something? I think as long as you're in the industry in some way, you start absorbing the, the fundamentals of that industry and what goes on in that industry. So I've had my hand into construction and into mortgage financing. I certainly think being, you know, real estate license is a useful one as well. Is that your thought as well? Oh yeah. That's probably the most common path that people that want to get involved in investing or already are, they think about, Hmm, I could be closing these deals myself, saving on commissions and doing that kind of thing. It crossed my mind back in the day too. But, um, I mean, part of the reason why I'm investing in real estate is to have the time freedom and to be able to travel and things like that. Whereas being a realtor is more hands-on and, and involves you like being present being there, yeah. with your clients. Um, whereas, you know, the mortgage side, you can, I mean, your phone and laptop is what you need and you can yeah. do that remotely. And that's what drew me to it, but totally agree. Uh, a realtor is a huge compliment to being an investor. Okay. So what are you doing on the side of mortgages? Like what's your specialty? What are you, what are you doing in that field? Inside of mortgages, you mean? Yeah. Like, are you, are you actively helping clients who come to you for investor mortgages, homeowners? Yes. What are you doing? Yeah, no, I like to specialize with investors because I understand what they're going through. And, you know, I like to kind of discuss their goals beyond the property that they're applying for, you know, what's the future going to look like and then kind of assigning products like that and incorporating a little bit of coaching mm -hmm. as well, which you don't necessarily get from the bank um, and kind of helping them 
broaden their ideas for how to scale their portfolio in the future. Okay. Right. So I do like working with investors in that way. And not everyone is a, a textbook type of client with good credit and good income. So you need to have some flexibility and work with other lenders as well. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it's obviously challenging nowadays. I can speak from my own experience. Like, I mean, as far as student rentals go, most banks don't want to touch them, especially through the broker channel. I've had some luck going directly to certain people in certain banks um, and that's worked. And I know some brokers will do that and they'll do it at, at, for a fee, which makes perfect sense. That's really a broker's job to know where to take the deal and to, to get it done. Um, of course. Are you seeing for investors, are, are you seeing a cap? Are you taking people to the commercial route where they can buy as many doors as they want? As long as they have at least five in a portfolio, they can just keep growing it. Is that your strategy for your clients? Or are you still trying to get it through on the residential side with, you know, your, your Scotia bank or something like that? Yeah, it's all like kind of situation dependent and the other sources of income that you have. Um, you can go beyond five properties on the personal side. I've done it myself as well, but you kind of need to come jump through the hoops on the income and credit side. And if you are capable of doing that, then yeah, I do recommend it because those residential mortgage rates can be extremely low. And you know, that's just going to improve your ROI on these, on these investment properties. However, once you scale your portfolio and get into bigger, bigger projects, you are going to want to incorporate and go the commercial route eventually anyway. Yeah. And then there's that concern of like, you know, you get 10 properties in your personal name and now you can't get a mortgage for your home because you have too many properties, right? Like a lot of banks, run the way they that. qualify, the way they qualify, you won't be able to get approved because they'll only give you 50% of the income on all the properties you have. So it'll look like you're just massively bleeding money, even though you're not, uh, and you won't be able to buy your home. So uh, that's something to consider, right? I mean, do you kind of focus with people on the bigger picture? What you want to consider both now and in the future, what are your goals as far as an investor and, you know, homeowner, all that stuff? For sure. That's part of the conversation. Like initially kind of understanding what their goals are, what they want to do for the future. Um, yeah, you can over leverage yourself on your principal residence and now you cannot get investment properties or you can get the investment properties first. And now you're a little bit tight on the primary res side. Yeah. So it's like, how badly do you want it? Where do you want to go with it? Can you live a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, within your means on the primary residence? Do you need all that space? Uh, those, yeah. those people that are driven to build the cash flow, it's like, okay, get the investment properties in first and then, yeah. and then worry about the primary after. That's what I did. Yeah. Uh, for me, it was all like, Hey, if I get a primary, I'm not going to be able to get mortgages on my rental property. Okay. No primary, <laughs> just uh, exactly, quote unquote, exactly. live with family. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, Discipline, right? Yeah. So that's, uh, you know, you got to do what it takes to get it done. I mean, a lot of some people house hack, you know, whatever it, it takes uh, going the conventional route in Canada is, you know, you go to get your nine to five, you work 40 years and then you retire on a very, um, inadequate pension, Canada pension, or even unemployment pension, people are having to live lean, never made any sense to me. I'm assuming it made no sense to you, which is why you went down this route so that we'll be wealthy in retirement rather than, you know, we'll have a basic pension that's a fixed income. Yeah, absolutely. That's always what, what drew me towards, you know, real estate investing and kind of investing as a whole and building other streams of income mm -hmm. passively, uh, because that, that typical route never, never made a lot of sense to me, nor was it like encouraging. Um, to work for, you know, four decades and retire off of less income for the rest of your life when you have all your time back. So now you have more time and less money. And this is why people get it. bored in right. retirement yeah. is because they're too time heavy and cash poor. It doesn't make sense. I want to be building more income throughout mm. the rest of my life indefinitely. Yeah. Cause as a rule, when we have more free time, we spend more money, not less. So yeah, I mean, <laughs> with our hobbies, yeah. with whatever. Right. So, um, yeah, makes, makes no sense. The traditional model. That's why, that's why we went down this road. Um, okay. So for you, your story, uh, first off, you don't look old enough to have bought your first property in 2009. What were you like 20 years old? I appreciate that. Uh, I was 22. Yeah. Yeah. 22. Okay. So you've, uh, you've had a lot of experience. So you started with the house hacking Were you, were you doing the Burr model before that was a thing before Burr was a thing? Um, not as like <sighs> structured as it, as it is now, you know what I mean? So I was kind of doing it behind the scenes, renovating, but I wasn't so, I didn't realize the power of refinancing as quickly as possible. I was back then I was waiting until the mortgage term was done which could be an extended two or three years waiting for that term to finish so that you could refinance. And now it's like, okay, that's, that was a mistake. You can refinance a lot sooner as long as you work that penalty in and it makes sense on the math side. But um, 
yeah, I was kind of fixing up some properties, um, leveraging as much as I can. I did the house hacking multiple times just so I could get the 5% down. And that was like a key component yeah. to me scaling, of course. And the bird doesn't work as well if you put 5% down because the refinance, mm. you need to leave 20. So you need to lift that value greatly. So, I mean, after that house hacking phase, then I got into that, you know, 20% down on a property, lift it, refinance it. Okay. So wh when were you really hitting that, that sort of burr model, the lift and refi? So I would say that was probably like 2015. Um, okay. Because in the meantime, in the meantime, I quit my job and became a professional poker player for three years, right? Oh, yeah. So there, so there was no earned income, and obviously that's going to affect your mortgage applications. I can't. There's no more. There's no poker player uh, as like a as a job or income that you can use. It's all a cash business. So that stunted my my growth in the real estate side. I was loving what I was doing. It's a lot of fun traveling, mm -hmm. but I couldn't grow quickly until I got a job again and then became a firefighter and that boosted my employment income and I could start scaling again and getting into different strategies. But along the way, I did like, you know, some low level burr stuff. Um, I did the lease to owns where at the end of the, yeah. at the end of the term prop, the, uh, the tenant buys the property, um, you know, remote investing, and then now kind of getting into looking elsewhere, other provinces and potentially the United States as well. Okay. Yeah. And we're going to, we're going to dig into that. Uh, it's funny, uh, so many full-time or at one point full-time poker players that, uh, I know or have known, um, it's, uh, it also goes hand in hand with a lot of real estate investors. Like you have to be a free thinker to, to go down that path to say, you know what? I don't like the conventional path. going to play poker cause that's fun and I'm good at it. Um, you gotta be willing to question things to do that path. So I think that goes really well into leaning into real estate investing as well. Um, yeah, a good friend of yes. mine is, uh, is similar. Yeah, he's the, he had to get a job eventually too, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, he's still like every Sunday, uh, tournaments all day kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. There's similarities there in the mindset in the risk tolerance and, you know, things like that, that kind of are synonymous between poker players and investors. And, um, I mean, yeah, I still play, I still love the game and I still travel to do it. Um, but, uh, it was a, an interesting phase yeah. to say the least. It's fine, but I, I don't think I could do it, uh, do it in that way. But, uh, another friend of mine actually raised the vast majority of everything he got like a million dollars and put that into real estate doing, right. uh, yeah. uh, we'll call it underground games. They weren't, uh, right. official tournaments, but cash games yeah. that, uh, you know, it started his, his real estate career as a, as an investor. So it can be a very useful tool. Although, I mean, if you don't already know that and grew up like enthusiastic about it, like definitely not recommending anybody go out and just try and learn poker to do that. Cause that's, uh, it's not the ideal, uh, path, but, uh, anyway, so I want to know more about you and what you're into. So overall your portfolio, what's that look like right now? Uh, multifamily scattered throughout Southern Ontario. I've moved around a bunch myself from like Durham and Toronto, the Niagara region. Um, so I was kind of building local properties mm -hmm. at the time. So I started in the Durham region. I've got a few, um, duplexes in Ajax. And then I started building a portfolio in St. Catharines, uh, duplexes and fourplexes there. Um, were you doing the renovations in, in St. Catharines? Not myself. But, no, but you were uh, hiring, yeah, like uh, you were renovating and burning. Okay. Could you yeah, not major, not major, like uh, dilapidated properties that need major lifts, yeah. but just cosmetic improvements to get top rent. Uh, but yeah, I did buy like a, a completely vacant fourplex and chose my own tenants and did some, and did some lift there. Mm -hmm. And then I got into the Windsor markets. Uh, I got into the uh, Gray County, Gray Bruce County market of like Owen Sound, Hanover, Durham. Okay. Yeah. I love that area been in there recently and some big opportunity there. Uh, and then, yeah, got some pre-construction condos as well, Toronto and Windsor. Okay. So, uh, were you like 20, 20 properties kind of range, something like yeah. that? Okay. Yeah, yeah. And are you joint ventured or are you mostly in on your own with these? 80 to 90% on my own and just okay. have kind of gotten into joint ventures in the last couple of years with okay. friends and family at this point. Yeah. I never so really just into, like, Consistent growth then. So you've just been consistent, consistent refinance, yeah. buy more. Okay. Yeah. Where are you yeah. looking for cash flow now? Because obviously cash flow is the unicorn in southwestern Ontario. It doesn't really I mean, you could still get it in like the Welland area, Fort Erie, but it's not like it was. Um, so where are you looking now? Are you still looking in those type of areas or are you elsewhere? 
Yeah, I think for like close proximity to, to GTA, I like the Niagara region a lot. Some of those cities you just mentioned, as, as well as St. Catharines, you can still get uh, cash flow there. But uh, in 2021, I've been buying in Windsor and uh, that northern region there, Hanover. Uh, Hanover? To get okay. cash flow, yeah. Are you into Wyerton as well? No, I don't have there. Uh, but a seven-unit uh, mixed use in, in Hanover just a few okay. months back. Nice. Yeah. There's, I think there's tons of opportunities out there. Cause it's, it's really not that far from Toronto. I mean, yeah, you're, you're about an hour and a half, probably from Hanover, two hours, something like that. Yeah, I'm about two hours from Hanover, yeah. but yeah, it's, uh, it's not that far and yeah. the rents are still good. You know what I mean? Compared yeah. to property prices. And people are going to keep moving from the GTA. They're going to sell their houses there, especially retirees and stuff. Like if they don't need to be close to GTA, they say, eh, well, let's just sell and we'll take our money and we'll live a little bit more lavish in Hanover or something like that. It, not in large scale, but that will happen in small scale. Oh, it's a huge point. And this is just the beginning of a potential large shift in the way that we work. So I think that's mm. like super bullish for the smaller towns outside of uh, yeah. the major regions, you know, and a little you know, bearish on the, the major epicenter like Toronto. Yeah. I think Toronto is still going to be stable and, you know, maybe go up a bit, but it's just going to become unaffordable for the average Canadian. Like we, we've got a lot of new immigrants that come into this country that have made money in other countries and they have, they have such wealth that they can buy these properties. Some of them are buying cash. They're not even buying using yeah. mortgages um, and they compete with us, you know, the people who were born here. And uh, because of that, we have to kind of adjust our strategy knowing that uh, maybe these big cities are going to become cities of renters. And I think that's probably the more likely thing to happen in the, in the, uh, the near future, but who knows? Yeah. No one's got a crystal ball. So, so tell me about the rest of your, your operation and what you're doing. So you're focused on mortgages. Is that like a full-time gig for you or part-time? Do you have a, an organization built around you for that? Yeah, it's more part-time kind of goes in hand in hand with the coaching that I do. Like I okay. help people kind of build and scale their portfolio on the real estate side. Um, as well as the other personal finance factor and even building out portfolios outside of real estate. And just as a complement to that, the mortgage goes hand in hand. I already know a lot about this person, what they want and, and how they want to scale their portfolio. So if I can do the mortgages for them, that's just going to help both of us. Okay. That's kind of, that's All where right. that ties in. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Now, I guess let's um, maybe it'd be a good idea if we actually went through a recent deal that you've done and just get an idea. Mm -hmm. um, like I do also want to ask you about kind of what you're thinking. You, you said the States, but let's just, before we go down that direction, let's talk about a recent deal. You said you did the seven plex in Hanover. Maybe we can do, uh, do the numbers on that. Um, just kind of back at the envelope, if that's all right with you. Sure. Yeah. yeah. That would was, you, uh... would you buy that one for? 545,000 with a 30 K wholesale fee. Oh, including the whole selfie? No, so five seventy-five. Okay, five seventy-five. I'm guessing you're getting the same wholesale emails that uh, that we all get. <laughs> There's a mil yeah. about a million lists I'm on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm sure they yeah. they're the same there. So yeah, that one came up. I mean, there were a few that I lost out on. They go quickly, just like the MLS deals. The good ones go fast. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, shout out to Mark Smith. He was the one who helped me on this. Okay, Mark. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And, uh, he's like, yeah, the next one, uh, next one I'm going to send your way. And this one came up and I'm running the numbers. I'm like, okay, yeah, this makes total sense for what I'm looking for as a slam dunk and, uh, just made it happen. Yeah. Well, I mean that right there, sounds like a really reasonable price to pay for, for seven units. So, um, what's the plan there? I mean, I'm, are you planning to burr it, improve it, raise the rents? Oh yeah. Okay. It was fully, it was fully occupied. There's uh, there's six two bedroom units and one commercial restaurant in, in the building. All rents are pretty low and it was just kind of a mismanaged property. That's, that's the deal with this one. So I saw tons of opportunity there to raise the rents and renovate for this property. And uh, there's some unused space. There's a full, like huge basement that is unused. That's just kind of being used for storage of old stuff. Uh, which I could potentially use for storage units. Okay. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't want to put apartments down there. It doesn't have a lot of windows and it's also on a large property and they're renting out some of the land to like a car dealer who's storing some, some of their excess cars just on the land. Okay. Did you have any issue with environmental for getting financing on that? Or I guess it's so small that they probably didn't Give it yeah, it was, it was a concern that I was like, oh, I might, but they're not doing any work. It's not an auto shop or anything like that. There's no oil yeah. and, and that kind of 
of stuff dripping into the land. So it's just storage of cars. Did you finance that with a credit union or just yeah. cash to start credit union? Local credit union up there. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I can predict these things. <laughs> if you're in this business, you kind of know, you know, the easiest way to get these, these type of things done. Um, yeah. It's not a Scotia bank mortgage. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. They're not going to, that's not going to be as easy to do with one of those banks. Um, okay. So you're a 575 purchase. Um, we'll get into what you think the rents are going to be, but how much money do you envision yourself spending here to get, you know, to do all your renovations? Uh, probably 15 K per residential unit. And you said there's there are how many of those? Them. Okay. So that's so. 90. Okay. And then uh, nothing on the commercial side? Well, if the, if the restaurant moves out, I'm going to consider different usage for that, for that property or for that unit. Um, restaurant kind of sits well where they are. It's on the main road of Hanover going in through cottage country and whatnot. So there's a big mm -hmm. parking lot there. People come in for the food and all that. But um, you know that lenders don't love restaurant tenants especially no right now um it's it's got a it's a long unit with two entrances on it and i would love to convert that into two residential units okay and make it an aplex all residential and have you talked to the to the city at all and asked what their appetite for that is like if they'd be willing uh, to allow you to do that like the zoning probably says there needs to be commercial there um, so they're, and your, and your main street. So it's, to me, in my experience, that seems it's pretty hard to get that done. Yeah, it's a good point. So this property has, it's one of those main level commercial buildings with yep. residential up top. So there were three commercial on the bottom and over the years, they've reduced that to one, just the restaurant now. Yeah. So there was like a dog grooming place in there recently. They just converted it to residential. And so I spoke with the guy from the city prior to closing to get his opinion. And you're like, what do I have to convert it back to commercial here? What's going on? And the response that I got was like a very laid back and these smaller towns, like this is amazing for, for permits and wanting to change the occupancy in these smaller towns. And he was just like, no, no, you, you're good with the way it was the, the previous owner has flip flops between commercial and residential a few times. We don't really love that but you know, you're good the way it is right now. And I'm like, wow, so there's nothing that I need to do as it stands. He's like, no, no, you're good. So, I mean, based on that conversation, yeah. it was really, really optimistic about the future. They just want to bring more capital to the city. They want more development and all that stuff. I didn't get into the specifics of changing the restaurant to, yeah. to residential yet, but I mean, that was just the, the first initial feel that I got. One of the things that occurred to me, like if, if I've got like a, it's street facing and I've got a, I've got a commercial unit on the main floor. Well, what if I could turn the back half into residential and then leave the front half with no rear access, or you just give them a hallway for rear access. Um, you know, maybe there are some ways to reconfigure so that you could still have storefront on the street, but you could maybe squeak in an extra residential unit or two. And then, you know, the storefront could just be like a juice bar or something really small that doesn't need much yeah. space, but it, I get it. Like if you think conceptually, like somebody's driving down the main street, like traditionally the main street was where you went to your, all your vendors. Right. So they wanted to have mm -hmm. street storefront. Um, so, so when certain cities push back and say, I don't want that, or we don't want that to be residential. I, I get it. It makes sense. So um, that just might be a thought. I don't know if that works for your layout, but it might be something to look into if there's a way that you can just do long units in the backside and have access there. Yeah, that's a great idea. I never thought about splitting it that way, front and back, and that mm -hmm. would be possible with this design. But um, I mean, the key, the key component here is that there's flexibility and there's other options that you mm -hmm. can do here. If the restaurant does move out, maybe it's a different commercial tenant that's not in the restaurant industry sure and maybe i could split it off but um worst well, what's case scenario wrong with restaurant like if people need to eat i mean restaurants not a bad thing i know banks like because restaurants come and go right that's not a solid tenant it's not shoppers drug mart but it's uh it's still profitable if you can keep putting them in there yeah well it's going to be a very small like mother and father type of restaurant mm -hmm. you know just trying it out for their first time um yeah. you're not going to get a long commercial lease you know, it's very fly by night. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's the downside as the landlord mm -hmm. um, to renting to a restaurant. It's great as is. I mean, I mean, they're, they're paying a very reasonable rate. So, I mean, if I change the occupancy, I don't see yeah. any downside, but if I keep it the same way, I don't see any downside either. Yeah. Okay. So you got some options there. Um, let's go through, well, first off, are you planning to refinance it once you get the rents boosted and, and do all that stuff? 
Yeah. So, I mean, I'm not super aggressive in getting the tenants out and turning them over and stuff like that. Fortunately, as soon as I bought it, one of the tenants said, um, unfortunately, we're going to be leaving at the end of the month. I was like, oh, bonus. That's amazing. So we can start on one. So I've got one unit vacant. Uh, I'm renovating it right now. And mm -hmm. that also happened to be the lowest paying tenant. So I'm going to get the greatest rent lift there. They were paying seven fifty yeah. for a two bedroom. And I guess after renovation, I mean, it should be 1250 to 1400. Okay. So we'll just so, say 1250 on, uh, on the low side. What are you, what are you uh, getting on the other ones right now? All the other ones range from like 800 to 1000. I okay. guess. Yeah. So kind they're of like all, averaging 900. Bad. Averaging probably lower than that. Probably averaging in the low eights to mid eights. But um, yeah, the plan is to turn over as many as I can in maybe a year or so and refinance. So another mm -hmm. key point here was that the appraisal before I even closed on the property came in hundred K higher than what I paid. Nice. So, so that came in at six seventy, and, you know, just raising the value on this unit. If I did a $500 per month, clean NOI raise, that'll add 80 K to the building okay. at a seven and a half cap. Okay. Yeah. Seven and a half. And I think you could, yeah, that's a reasonable cap rate for that. Yep. Um, commercial unit. What's that run for? 900. Let's see, just see. Oh, just a little one. That's yeah, it's small. It's a big unit. I mean, a restaurant could easily be paying fifteen hundred there. Yeah. So as it is, just just right now, you're sixty two seventy five. Once you've rented the one you're renovating, if you get twelve fifty, that's sixty two right. seventy five across the whole building. Um, yeah. And then you could get. You're saying you could get it up to like say twelve hundred on average per unit if you push yeah. to turn them all over. Not the commercial yeah. necessarily, but the other ones. Yeah. Okay. So let's just say that one stayed the same. So hypothetically the rents could go to overall 8150. So right now you're 6250. So let's just see 62. Oh, 6275. Uh, what's your tax? Um, what's your tax bill there annually? Uh, 8,000. 8,000. And then insurance on a building like that, it's like four grand or something. 5,400. And maintenance 5% of safe estimate. Yeah. Seems a little low, right? Like you could spend more mm. than that. With 37. Yeah. Uh, I'm yeah. using six. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll throw it up to six. Um, common utilities. Like what are you paying on an annual basis there? So the way the previous landlord had it was that all tenants were paying for all utilities. Now the hydro and the gas are separately metered, which is great, but the water is not. So they were just kind of splitting it equally, which I don't like doing. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'll leave those leases as is and just charge what the previous landlord was charging for, for water, but for new tenants, I will pay the water. I think that's okay. the more fair way to go and have them pay for what, for what they use on the hydro and gas end. Um, so essentially gas and hydro, there's no common areas. So I gas and hydro yeah. are zero. How can gas be separated though? Are there separate furnaces in each, each unit? Yeah. They have like forced air separate furnaces in each one. Yeah. That whole monster basement has a bunch of furnaces. Down. Holy crap. That's really yeah. cool, man. I've never yeah. seen that. Yeah. They're all forced air, like sending duct work right up. Mm -hmm. That's so cool. Okay. So that that's actually really handy that you can separate all that. So you're going to be paying just water going forward right now. You're not really paying anything. Exactly. Yeah. So now it's like pretty much zero, but it could be, um, what do you say? Like three, 3,000 a year or something like that. Yeah. I've got 3,600, 300 a month for water. Okay. So it could be, we'll, we'll play with that number. Um, mm -hmm. any other expenses you're expecting to have there, like snow removal, grass cutting, or there's no space for that. Yeah. There's, there's some grass and snow. I've budgeted a uh, hundred bucks a month on average. Okay. So you're about 1200 a year there. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I usually throw in like a $500 miscellaneous. Are you going to pay a management? Yeah. The goal is to outsource management here. I haven't built uh, the big network there yet to, to get someone to take it over. Mm -hmm. So I'm currently managing it right now with my company, but obviously being two hours away, it's not ideal. Right. But, right. Uh, yeah. There will be a management expense in there. Okay. So I'm going to look at this two different ways. So right now kind of valuation, like how, how your numbers look, cause you're in with a full down payment of 25%, I guess. Yes. And then what it could be. So just as is, um, with the current situation and setup at a 575, that's what, that's what you said you bought it for, right? Uh, yeah. With including the fee, 75% mortgage, I'm guessing, or 65? Yeah, 75. 75, 25 year amortization? 25 year. And what interest rate did you get? 
four and a half. 4.5. Okay. So your cap rate just as is was like 9.68%. Exactly, so no yeah. wonder he, no wonder the appraiser appraised it higher. Cause that's a really high yeah. cap rate. So yeah. uh, Mark did you a solid on that one. So props to Mark for finding that. Um, yeah. Your cash flow just to start is 2250. So even with a full down payment there, you're still uh, thinking this is calculating correctly. Uh, you're still like a 32% return on investment, even with a full down payment. Yeah, it's outstanding. The only the only curveball was the way that this credit union structures their mortgage payments. Is they want um, they want consistent principal payments throughout the life of the mortgage. So you end up paying the same amount of principal each month. So essentially, your mortgage payment goes down every month because the interest is reduced. As opposed really? to keeping as opposed to keeping the payment the same and having the ratio change every month. They won't do a blended payment or a, a readjusted yeah. payment. Yeah, so the I've payments never started off real that. high. Neither had I. Wow. So that adjusted my cash flow majorly, which you know makes me want to refinance sooner to get a more standardized mortgage payment. But at the same time, I'm paying off, I'm getting a lot more principal payment here and less cash flow for the time being. Okay. So you're not actually getting 2250 right now. Um, no. what, is your, what is your more reasonable cash flow? Uh, the mortgage payment is 2800. 2800. Okay. So. So I had the mortgage payment at 23. So you're, you know, you're basically, well, 400, 2386. So you're about $400 more. So your cash flow is more like 1600, yeah. which is still yeah, really yeah. great. So, For sure. and then hypothetically, if you were to turn over all those units and get the, you know, get 1200 on average, you'd probably be somewhere around 8150 um, on your gross rent, something like that. Obviously that's going to vary. And then we're going to go ahead and throw in that 3600 a uh, year for, uh, the water. Mm -hmm. And, um, we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and assume that you're refinancing it. What do you figure it's worth at that point? Uh, what numbers is used for the gross, for the gross around 8,200? Um, yeah, like 8,250 or eight, sorry, 8,150. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm looking to get this. It's going to be closer to a million. So you might get like 950 or something. Yeah. 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 So, so you, using, uh, using a conservative, like seven and a half to eight cap based on that new NOI. <clears throat> yeah. So you, you could get like a 712, like 75% of nine fifty. that'd be like seven, 12, 500 new mortgage, mm -hmm. uh, which means you're pulling out, you know, your, your purchase and improvements is like six sixty five. So you're, you're going to be pulling out. Uh, let's just calculate that. No, forty seven thousand five hundred dollars. So let's just calculate that new mortgage payment. So let's assume that you're worth nine fifty and still at four and a half percent. Let's assume it wasn't wonky. Uh, assuming the rents were higher, like we just said, your cash flow would be the same, twenty two hundred bucks a month. So your payments are higher on the mortgage, but you're making a lot more on the on the rent. Um, so your return now becomes infinite because you just pulled out a whole bunch of money and have nothing into the deal other than your time. And uh, rinse and repeat. If you can do more deals like that, it sounds like you'd probably probably want to do those. Oh man, it's a slam dunk. Yeah, in, in, in real in real life, like I mean, I'm probably not going to turn over all of those units in the short term. But no, I it's going to be a, a process, few. right? Yeah. yeah. So you yeah. might you might fall somewhere in between the two scenarios we mm -hmm. just did. Yeah. Yeah. You may have to re refinance twice over the over the coming yeah. years, right? Do you have like a place that you're going to put money right away? If say you do refi, like, cause I think a lot of people right now are refinancing and they're like, oh, okay, I got all this money or I got this line of credit room, um, need something to buy now. And they can't find cash flow. Do you have a place that you're always ready to put money? And if so, where is that place? Yeah. I don't hold cash for long at all. Yeah. Um, like I always have deals coming across my desk from those sources you were talking about earlier. Even when I'm not looking for properties, I don't have, you know, the down payment yet or whatever. I'm always looking. So I know what a good deal is. Um, I see these properties coming up. I'm even looking in say Sudbury in that area. I think there's big cash flow there. Mm -hmm. um, so when, when I know I'm doing a refinance and I'm going to get the, get the money in a, you know, a few weeks to a month, I'm starting to look aggressively already and getting, um, you know, getting primed for what I'm going to put the money into and I mean, I'm also into stocks, options, and crypto as well, man. So I mean, if there's uh, if there's opportunity there, I'm looking elsewhere. So I mean, there's always like I've got my finger on the pulse in a few markets, and uh, wherever wherever the best opportunity is at the time, that's where I'm aiming to put my money. And 
it's important to note that like longer term, I will be scaling a little back from real estate and into those more passive yeah. investments like stocks and options. Yeah. Are you doing uh, options trading like so many of our real estate and investing counterparts? Yeah. I trade options for income. Like, yeah, I don't speculate. I sell, yeah. right. I use the wheel strategy. I sell puts and, and covered calls. Okay. Where'd you learn that? Uh, geez, I've been doing it for a while. Uh, I think from those Derek Foster books, um, oh, okay. you know, money yeah, for Derek nothing, Foster. Yeah. that type of thing, those purple books. Yeah. Simplifies it so easily. That's like what got me hooked on like the early retirement and stock portfolio and dividends, and amplifying your returns using covered calls. And like, yeah, that's, that makes sense. But I don't think it's that as attractive until you start getting a much bigger portfolio and those, those premiums are getting bigger, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. I, I know so many people doing that. I think, I think Mike Rose Hart's doing, <laughs> I have no idea, but I think he's actually investing several million dollars. Like he's got several million dollars in, in, uh, um, stock, uh, well, stock options, covered calls yeah. and, and, uh, and puts, I, I haven't asked him, but I've seen him post on his stories. He posts like <laughs> the daily profit and loss numbers. Exactly. Are massive. So yeah, uh, yeah. Must, there must be a seven figures there for sure. <laughs> yeah, there's there's uh, obviously an opportunity there. This is one I hear come up on the show all the time, and um, man, it's just time in the day. And I'm not sure if you if you find that, but um, you know, there's so many things kind of like vying for my time that uh, that that's something I haven't gotten into yet, but uh, definitely something I see some value in. And so, so you're consistently up on that as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, everybody goes watching. through ups and downs, but I mean, overall, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, up and yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, it's been a longer term strategy for me. I've been doing it for years, not as aggressively as the guys that are trading options every single day. I mean, I'm trading every week for sure on multiple Okay, so you're stocks. not on the app every day. I'm on the app every day, but if I don't you're see not the right moves every day, yeah. yeah, I'm not making moves. Like, yeah, I'm not like, I'm pretty disciplined with it. Um, but yes, I mean, if we go through some type of a correction in real estate, you want to have liquidity. And if all of your money is tied up in real estate and you can't refi, and that's where I'd be looking for like maybe some overvalued stocks and other assets to maybe liquidate and buy real estate on the cheap. Yeah, that's, that's actually a smart idea. Um, but I feel like if real estate massively corrects, it's probably going to come hand in hand with the stock market correction. Like I think the stock market correction is actually more likely to, to correct um, first. And then that will trickle into real estate. That's, uh, and who knows for sure, but here's how I see, sort of see it um, playing out. I see like stock market first, um, then pensions go. If pensions like realize massive losses, then that's when people tighten up and stop spending, which would then slow real estate. Um, I'm not sure if you, if you see it differently. And I'm actually curious, you know, what, what, your, what concerns you? Is there anything that keeps you up at night about what's coming? Or do you feel like you're well hedged? And, um, you know, if you, do, if you do see that correction coming, where do you see it coming? Yeah, I do think that the stock market is more of a leading indicator from real estate. The, the moves happen much quicker in, in the stock market, and that's usually where the first hit happens. However, it also rebounds a lot quicker than real estate does. Real estate is just a slow, gradual upward movement, slower, gradual dip, and it can stay in that dip for a long time, whereas the stock market could have rebounded. And depending on what sector that you're in, I mean, technology could easily be moving higher as real estate's going lower. Um, but I mean, it, there's so many scenarios that could happen here. And when I talk about real estate, I don't think it's a major crash coming. I don't think we're going to see 30% correction uh, territory here in Canada or the U.S. in the near future. But I'm even talking about smaller dips in a more balanced market where you can get deals easier than you can right now. Yeah. Whereas right now, it's still so competitive. And if you're in different markets... Um, that are not correlated so much. Now you might be able to capitalize on the difference yeah. in, you know, and in, in where they're at. I mean, crypto is completely different. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, taking gains there and moving into real estate yeah. would be wise. Okay. So were you on the, uh, on the uh, roller coaster there for the Bitcoin coming down from 70,000 US <laughs> down to wherever it is now in the thirties? Yeah. I bought my first Bitcoin at $1,000 in 2017 at the beginning and uh, rode that whole 2017 um, wave and roller coaster, which is very similar to, to right now, because it peaked yeah. in the, at, the, at the end of 2017, it came way crashing down. And, um, you know, it's a little bit more stable than, than that. So, I mean, I got, I got the, the pukey feeling back then. So this is a little bit easier yeah. to, to go through, but yes, I am going through it. 
you know you're up the overall difference, yeah. oh god yeah now the difference this time around is that they have those banks where you can stake your crypto and earn interest on it while you're going through these corrections just make it makes it a lot more attractive getting you know five six percent yield on your crypto oh really okay hadn't hadn't heard about that so that's actually uh interesting that you can you can leverage that and, and earn some uh some returns on it because the question i always have about bitcoin is you know, and I say this with, with anything, right? If, if, if all of a sudden everyone stops valuing the dollar bill in my wallet, what can I do with it? I, I can, you know, maybe use it to start a fire. It can be good kindling. And uh, <laughs> if I have gold and silver, if everyone else in the world stops, stops valuing it, what can I do with it? Well, maybe I can make an electronic capacitor or something like, you know, it's a good conductor, silver or gold. Uh, same question for crypto. If everyone else in the world stops valuing it, what can I do with it? <laughs> look at it on look at it on a screen look at it on no, a screen. It's, it's, yeah valid question man i like where you're going with that and having a roof over your head investing in real estate obviously yeah, has that's why major major that. use right that's, right that's, that's why i like commodities i do like there's absolutely and i don't say that to say like there's not a place i just feel like i'm more speculating with crypto but um i just uh i, I love i love commodities and i and there is absolutely no perfect solution like so in my mind it's like Fiat currency is the worst. Bitcoin is a step up. It's slightly better because you can't print it at, you know, ad nauseum. And then mm -hmm. you've got gold and silver. I think that's a slight improvement because it's uh, it's more rare. It's more sparse. Of course, it can be found. We can mine more of it. And there's there's pros and cons to that too. Uh, but it's got the history. It's still not perfect. And then you got like grain and land and water and real estate and all these other things that, uh, that people are just always going to need. And that's kind of where my head thinks, uh, you know, where, you know, where I look at this stuff and I don't know, um, if you, if you are preparing in that way, are you looking to buy commodities as well in case there is an issue with our currency going forward in case people don't value our dollar like they have in the past? I'm not buying commodities for that sense. And I, I, I truly don't have the ultra pessimistic, type of uh, mindset, like kind of world ending type of not using currency anymore. I mean, I think if we're having those problems where well, it's not ending, but I mean, inflation's happened even in the seventies, right. They had, you know, double digit yeah. inflation. Um, we yeah. want to make sure we've got our money in assets, right. Whether that's commodities oh, sure. or real yeah. estates. Yeah. Like I said, I don't hold a lot of money in cash at all. And I mean, mm -hmm. my emergency fund is, is lines of credit. It's not even cash. Okay. So you're not even right? holding like a base level of cash. It's like, so low. It's so low. I mean, I, I, like I have 50 grand income. or something. I've, 10 I have grand? Con yeah, exactly. Like I, yeah. I have so much like sources of income that will, that will stabilize yeah. me. And I could easily like downgrade my living. If things, yeah. if, if something happened, it's, it's a lot of flexibility there. Whereas I don't feel I need to have this large, six figure cash yeah. reserve or something like that. I have multiple six figure lines of credit at two to 3% that's that awesome. I can yeah. use in an emergency. That's, that's just as good. Inflation is that or more. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You're, if you're borrowing money at 2% right now, the bank's losing money lending to you because inflation it's... is definitely beyond 2% right now. There's no question. And if you look back on interest rates and inflation rates all throughout history, we will look back on this period unless we stay in this period forever and be like, what an opportunity to borrow money and buy assets. Like, Oh yeah. The writing was on the wall. You borrow yeah. money at 2% inflation is 3.6 or higher. That's like yeah. the posted and you can buy assets that pay for the interest and a lot more. I mean, it's a slam dunk. It's right there. That's yeah. the opportunity right now during this decade or more. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that leads me into the next question. Okay. So, so what is next for you? You bought, you bought in Hanover. You said you're looking at the States. Uh, I know you, you talked about the crypto. So, so what's next in the real estate uh, lens? On the real estate, like I'm always going to keep scaling. Um, I love now that I have a taste of this type of multi-unit value add on the commercial mixed use space. That's where I'm headed. Um, more of those types of deals and maybe selling off the underperforming duplexes that have just skyrocketed mm -hmm. in value and the numbers just don't make a lot of sense anymore. Um, just kind of uh, accepted an offer on one duplex yesterday to sell my weakest performer and okay. uh, scale it into the larger stuff, the larger value add multi-unit projects. Um, I still like Ontario. I'm looking in Calgary and I'm looking at some areas in the States, mm -hmm. but yeah, I just want to keep growing the portfolio, but not like as crazy aggressive as some people are that have just like, I need hundreds of units and the people that are, you know, just all about number of units or portfolio size. For me, it was always like build the lifestyle that you want, like design the lifestyle and have your investments pay for that lifestyle and then some, mm -hmm. and just kind of understand the game of money and solve it so that you're just progressively yeah. moving forward fairly easily while enjoying your life, well, that's like way more important than the money side. 
Absolutely. Right. Yeah. You don't want to be a slave to your properties if you grow too fast. Right. They like ca not casual, but very, um, very, you know, planned out in, in consistent growth versus really fast. Yeah. You still want that element of growth on the financial side, as well as like the self-development side and all that, but just putting less emphasis on money and business and, in, and investments and more on the other areas of life, because throughout my twenties mm -hmm. to get growing, you have to put a lot of emphasis on money for at least a phase of your life to get it rolling. Yeah. And then once you kind of understand the game, then you can yeah. scale back if you want to and not get totally addicted to more money. More is always better, more things, all that stuff. Right. Yeah. So where do you live right now? Where's home for you? Toronto. I'm in West Toronto, South of Tobacco. West Toronto. And you've been there a long time. Mm, I've been three years. I've been here for three years. Yeah. Like I said, I moved around, um, from Ajax. I went to Niagara when I was the pro poker player, Okay, came back, settled in Toronto in a couple different areas. Like I love living here. I love the community and you know, the, the busyness here, but mm -hmm. on an investment side, doesn't fit my goals. Yeah. Well, no, it's pretty tough to make sense of it, especially with the Airbnb restrictions. Now it did make sense for Airbnb for a while, but, uh, mm -hmm. that seems to, uh, have changed as well. Um, okay. And in specific markets in the U S which ones do you like? So we've got a potential JV deal going on in Michigan. This is a 55 unit building, um, super strong. And it's not that Michigan is the area I want to invest specifically. It's just where this deal has come up. But um, outside of that, I love Florida. Um, I want to like vacation and spend some time there and uh, would love to build a portfolio there as well. It's just everybody else wants Florida too. You know, Florida is, yeah. uh, and I think you were spending a fair amount of time there, right? Yeah. Looking through properties. Yeah. What was yeah, your, I, um, what was your experience with that and overall feel? Uh, you know, great place to be. And uh, really hot in the summer, of course. But I mean, as far as real estate investing goes, they've got a really, good, really good community in Southwest Florida where I was. And um, Cape Coral made a lot of sense to me, so I did sign contracts on five lots there. I've had had a couple of complications in closing a few of them. Um, I guess the seller realized he could get more money and is uh, is sandbagging now. And uh, one of them actually was a uh, fraudulent seller and uh, who's trying to commit fraud and, and sell something he didn't own. So we caught that. So nothing lost there. But um, so I closed one of them, hoping to close two more and then look for a couple more and basically just be uh, building. Um, so there's, you know, building still reasonably affordable down there uh, makes a lot of sense relative to what these projects are going to be worth. So for a sort of a burr build uh, strategy, it makes a lot of sense down there. But Otherwise, you know, the rent numbers can be 0.75% or, you know, 0.65 to 0.75. So not bad, better than Ontario mm -hmm. in general, or at least Southern Ontario. And then of course you've got being in Florida, but you know, on the con side of things is being a foreign national, you're going to pay higher interest rates. So anything you're kind of getting in better rents um, could be eliminated by your financing. So it, it's a tricky thing. You've got to pick a strategy if you're going to do Florida and it's got to make sense being a Canadian, you have to be able to weigh that. And I figured something out that does work for me, but it doesn't mean it would work for everyone. Yeah. So my theory on investing in the U S cause I've toyed with it over the years, several times. And I had offers in on properties in Florida, actually in 2010, when they were super, super cheap, I put everything was bank owned. It was all foreclosures. And I looked at a bunch of condos and there was one in specific, um, on a golf course, two bed, two bath, fully furnished. And it was listed at $72,000. Mm -hmm. I put an offer in for 65 yeah. and ended up not getting it because of this like stupid few thousand dollars. Like I was completely yeah. leveraged at that point. I had to do get a Canadian line of credit to cover the whole thing, buy it in cash, worried about, worry about a mortgage later. So it was like, a little bit out of my comfort zone, but I realized that the opportunities were massive and these properties just outside of our Orlando and Kissimmee, um, are like 300,000 now. And the exchange rate also was 1.2, whereas it was just par back then. So, um, yeah, I've always been looking at the, at the U S market on and off, but my theory is like, if you're going to make that big leap, jump in with two feet and having a, have a plan of buying multiple properties and yeah, building don't a big do portfolio. It for you don't get in there yeah. for like a couple of duplexes or something because mm -hmm. your time, the value of your time to learn the different uh, rules now. and it's like, it's not worth it. Might as well just invest in your backyard here. I agree with you completely. Yeah. You don't do it for one or two or even five. I mean, this is part of a bigger mm -hmm. strategy for me. So, um, you know, a few hiccups along the way. 
Um, but what I wanted to do is I wanted to have a political hedge. I wanted to have uh, money on both sides of the border and flexibility and have, uh, have an investor visa in the U.S. so that I could easily transition and, you know, spend some time down there and also become a tax resident there. So there were some advantages. Um, it's not to say that I was going to do that, but just having the option. Um, so I am working through that, uh, that visa process as well. And uh, there's just, you know, it never hurts to have those options and that flexibility. Yeah, I love that as like an additional factor because um, I'd be in the same boat. I mean, uh, using the citizenship or the the immigration as a as a way in using real estate. I mean, that's mm -hmm. that's huge. I would I would love to do that just because I mean I'm not a fan of the Canadian winters. Uh, yeah, and, uh, and I mean, the, the Canadian taxes too. too, right? Like, yeah. I mean, no yeah. state income tax in Florida. If you were if you were to be in a U.S. state for six months plus a day, and then you were back in Canada for you know five six months less a day, um, you'd be the U.S. tax resident, not paying tax in Canada, but still be able to spend time here. And uh, yeah, that sounds all right. <laughs> yeah, that's huge. I mean, taxes are a big expense. Yeah, absolutely. So anyways, it's been really interesting just chatting with you. Uh, Brian, any words of wisdom you'd want to share with our listeners and viewers, anything you'd like to tell them uh, before we wrap up? Well, um, in my experience, the people that I usually speak to that want to get into real estate, there's a lot of them who are educated because of like podcasts like this and all of the educational content out there. There's tons of it now, mm -hmm. right? 10, 12 years ago, it was just like reading books and stuff like that. It was a little bit so what I'm getting at is a lot of people are educated, but what's holding them back is taking the action and they come become a little bit overeducated and they kind of underperform on the, on the action side. It's not like, it's not reading books or the, the education that's going to make you money. It's taking action on what you've mm -hmm. learned from the books and the education that's going to make you money. Yeah. So my advice is to just get started. If you've got the education and you're ready to go, like, it's time to get started and just kind of buy your first property and start making moves because that's, you know, the, the main advantage that I have was starting early and I didn't, I didn't know a quarter of what I know now, but I figured it out along the way. Yeah. I a base. Yeah. You got to rent out a property. I didn't know about some of the tenant issues. I didn't know about some of the property repairs that are going to come along, but you figure it out as you deal with those problems, you're not going to learn them all from books and podcasts. Yeah. So it's like take action and then grow from there. Just keep leveling up every year. Yeah, that makes a, makes a lot of sense. And I started back, you know, around the time you did too, where there wasn't the resources there, there are now. I think Rich Dad Poor Dad was around, but it wasn't, it wasn't like there was much else. And uh, yeah. now, yeah, you're absolutely right. The information has never been more abundant. But the competition has never been more abundant either, and the uh, and the prices of real estate aren't the same. So um, we have advantages and disadvantages from back then, but it's still it's still very much doable. And uh, yeah, I agree. People got to get started somewhere. So, but a key caveat is you got to feel like you're ready. If if you're like oh, I'm not sure, but I think I am, you know, maybe that's the right spot for you. Everybody's different, but I agree with you. Sometimes you got to take action. Yeah. You do got to step out of your comfort zone though. You yeah. know what I mean? You can't wait until you're fully ready. You should be uncomfortable. Yeah. Mostly ready. Yeah. Mostly ready, ready enough to not lose money, <laughs> but, yeah. but not ready enough that you're not going to scrape your knee a couple of times in the process. For sure. Yeah. Which again, how do you define that? Right. Like it's so, so tough. So like you said, got to step out of your comfort zone and everybody not advice, do that at your own, your own discretion and based on your circumstances, but uh, okay. That's great. Where do people reach you, Brian, if they'd like to follow you or, uh, or connect with you? Most of my content is on real or is on uh, Instagram. That's where I post okay. the most Brian J Bouchard. That's where you can find me there. And then within Instagram, you can find the links to like, book a consultation call with me or just have a chat. You know, I'm happy to, to chat okay. all things, real estate, money, personal finance. Awesome. Sounds good. I'll put your info in the show notes so people can reach out to you there. And uh, yeah, thank, thank you very much. It was great connecting. Yeah. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Okay. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. Please make sure to share this episode far and wide. Help it help more people. I really appreciate you tuning in. Thanks. I'll see you on the next one. <laughs>